Hi, everyone. Welcome to the September meeting of Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm Ricky Bradley, and I'm a member of CCL staff. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to give a special welcome right now to the 120 CCL volunteers who are joining us today from the Great Lakes Regional Conference in Notre Dame, Indiana. We're going to bring them up here on, on spotlight in just a second. So when you see them there, please wave. There they are. Woohoo! Yay, look at that crowd. Awesome to see that. Thank you so much for everyone for being there. And this is a reminder to stay tuned uh, at the end of today's meeting because we're bringing back the roving camera so we can spotlight chapters as they're meeting worldwide together. So make sure you stay tuned for that at the end of today's call meeting. Uh, so let's take a quick look at where everyone is joining us from today. In the chat prior to this uh, meeting get started, we asked you to drop a pen on the map. Uh, right before that got started. And you can see lots of folks joining from the U.S., a few folks from uh, Hawaii joining us as well. So that's great to see. you got a good uh, regional distribution across the U.S. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Now, here at CCL, we're a nonpartisan grassroots climate organization. Again, uh, we're a nonprofit uh, grassroots climate organization. Our local chapters and like the folks there on screen are, are just regular folks like you and me who are discovering your political power in lobbying Congress for big and effective policies to address climate change. And the great news is that we're doing it together. It's whether you're liberal or conservative, doesn't matter if you're members of Congress or Republicans or Democrats, you're welcome here. We're all connecting in our communities, building bridges in DC, because we want to solve the climate crisis together. If you're new to CCL, our mission is to create the political will for a livable world. And we want to do that by empowering individuals to experience breakthroughs and exercising their personal and political power. Sometimes that's a little bit of a mouthful, so I like to break it down to this. We create political will by empowering people to have breakthroughs. A little more simpler, that's just for me to remember, and maybe it helps you because that's a lot to remember sometimes in one sentence. So today's agenda, let's take a look at that real quick. Our guest speaker today is Madeline McGill, founder of Western Desk, whose aim is helping good people build climate communications programs around uh, that reflect their values and their potential. To that end, Madeline is partnering with the Rural Climate Partnership, who is transforming the rural narrative on climate solutions. And their goal is to reach across cultural differences and avoid culture war frames to connect on shared values. After we hear from Madeline, we're going to um, discuss a little bit about our uh, actions from August and take a look at what's ahead for us in the, the months and beyond. And then, you know, when it comes to empowering individuals to experience breakthroughs, uh, we'll have some special folks on at the end, uh, Drs. Lori and Rob Byron. Um, they're going to tell us about their experience giving testimony in the Our Children's Trust case against the state of Montana. You really don't want to miss that. So let's dive in. Madeline, I want to welcome you to the meeting. We're uh, super excited to hear about the work of the Rural Climate Partnership and how we might better ourselves and continue the work that we do of building bridges. So I want to thank you for being here today. Thanks, Ricky. It's good to be here. And hello to everyone. It's, uh, it's a delight to see how many folks are attending in person. My name is Madeline. I am a communication strategist and storyteller, and I'm a partner of the Rural Climate Partnership here to talk to you about transforming the rural narrative on climate solutions. I myself live in a small town in Southern Utah. I'm from the Four Corners area and hello to it sounds like to folks in the Great Lakes and beyond. So we have a bunch to get through, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, this presentation is transforming the rural narrative on climate solutions. And what that means is le leveraging a benefits forward strategy to connect with hardworking rural Americans. So we believe at the Rural Climate Partnership that the road to climate progress runs right through rural America. And to reach those folks, we have to skip what the climate movement has often made our narrative strategy, which is to move folks, folks from concerned to alarmed to action takers. Our approach is to go straight to people's self-interest. You already know the realities of the landscape that we're working within. Right, A growing concern about extreme weather within rural communities does not equate to motivation for climate action. Divisive narratives on climate change are all around us and sometimes they're not even language that we can use in our own messaging. So today we're gonna talk about people who are not motivated by a moral obligation on climate. That 50% of rural folks who believe that climate change is not human caused. And the question is, how do we shift the narrative in those rural communities to embrace climate solutions? 
I'll start by saying we don't lead with climate alarmism. It's never a winning strategy for rural audiences. Um, and we will not move people at the speed we need if we rely on the altruism of it's good for future generations. Instead, we're going to make the argument that people need to see it in their own community's self-interest to pursue clean energy, regenerative agriculture, electric vehicles, heat pumps, or whatever climate solution we're talking about. In short, economics drives decisions far more than the latest news about a tornado or a wildfire. We suggest following a standard order of operations to reach rural people on climate, and we're going to go through the four of those now. The first, meeting on shared values. So we are all united by our shared values, and that is especially the case for rural communities. Thinking about folk fable, right? The way that stories are told in rural landscapes is especially poignant. And we see, pardon me, we see from research from Emily Diamond at the University of Rhode Island that rural communities have values and priorities that differ from folks in urban areas, but that that shared rural worldview contributes to a sense of social identification with other rural Americans. And some of those common values are, which I'm sure that many of you will recognize from living in rural spaces, a close interaction and reliance on the natural world, a feeling of being left behind or cut out from major governance, decision-making processes, a deep connection to land, communities, a sense of place, a, a, a sense of independence and pride in our ability to fend for ourselves, and being hard workers. So this brings the question of uh, what does it mean to be a hard worker, right? And what does it mean to center working people in our order of operations? I'm going to go through five keys really quickly, so buckle up, to talk about what it means to center working people in our climate messaging. The first, center working people as heroes. That means appreciating and acknowledging the contribution of hardworking people. It means leading with them and naming their concerns. Whoopsie daisy, sorry. So when we think of working people who are central to our narrative, their personal agency is paramount and people respond most favorably to messaging that respects that agency, like this headline. Centering working people means leading with them and naming with them. When in doubt, try to make them the first statement in your sentence. I'll also say that there's a lot of ways that we can name people, right? A photo is worth a thousand words. It's not always text. Sometimes it's visual, it's videography, boots covered in muck, like in this example. All of that can help us demonstrate credibility. Number two, support and value the importance of work. Meeting people on the shared value of hard work and what it means is a crucial way to start a conversation on climate solutions. If working people are the heroes in our first key, and if we all identify as hardworking, shouldn't our hard work result in livable wages, good benefits, and respect on the job? People support policies that are about supporting and enabling work. And it's not necessarily about romanticizing work, right? This isn't a pull yourself up by your bootstraps framework. It's saying that we all want to participate. Being a hardworking person in a rural place is a core and deeply rewarding part of who we are and how we see ourselves. It's about self and family, responsibility. It's about building a good life for ourselves and each other. Because when we do our part, contributing in the ways we can, we have a fair shot at both a good life and a more thriving community for all of us. Uh, this is an example from the farm where I work, actually, um, but it's not about glorifying work, right? It's about centering ourselves and our families. And just a couple of messaging do's and don'ts. Sorry, well, there we go. <laughs> it does mean using the term respecting working people and not using the term rewarding working people. It does not mean leading with climate disasters or greenhouse gas emissions, but do lead with making people's lives better and improving economies. All right, powering through. The third key is situating working people as the engines of the economy. And so there are two competing mental models for how the economy works, right? There's trickle down, this idea of policies favoring big corporations and the wealthy will trickle down and benefit everybody else. but History has shown us that everyday people rarely, if ever, benefit from government favoritism towards big corporations and the wealthy. And so we're making the case of centering people from what we call a middle-out economic model, which helps us draw on an accurate 
model of how many people perceive how the economy works. People believe that the economy works from the middle out and not the top down, meaning that the reality is that the economy is driven by the work, spending, and contributions of everyday people. When we, the workers, get a raise and have more money, we're able to spend that money in our communities, which helps local economies thrive. What's good for our rural small towns and businesses and farmers is good for the community at large. Back to working Americans for a moment. Uh, it comes back again to values and identity. People see hardworking families, small businesses, and family farmers as the backbone of the economy. Therefore, economic growth should be measured by how working people are doing, whether they have good quality jobs, good wages, can afford the housing and other basic things we need to build a life. Number four, positioning the government and corporations in a supporting role. So this one's a little tricky, but what it means is when people express sentiments like people want a hand up, not a hand out, they're saying that people want to be empowered, not rescued. And this is really important for understanding how rural communities think. Messaging that makes it seem as though the government and progressives are coming to the rescue to help people falls way flat. The truth is that climate solutions are very much about empowering people and removing the barriers that hold them back. Centering government in our messaging is a losing proposition. Government isn't the hero, working people are. The worst thing you can say in a rural community is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Sometimes it feels like the government is really far away from our everyday lives, but people do care about policy that impacts those very day-to-day -day lives. Most people want the government to support them, but not do for them, which registers in our messaging as paternalistic. An example, as hardworking rural Americans, we see the importance of our own agency in our lives and want that to be honored and respected. In our narratives and messaging, we must center communities as having that agency and not taking it away. Remember that when we lift up who is the hero and who we are supporting, working people always come first and we always lead with them. Now, one quick thing, we need to tre tread carefully in our messaging on how we center villains. And centering villains is almost always wrong, though we can still name them. Instead, focus on what villains do to harm working families and not necessarily on their villainy. For example, try criticizing billionaires for outsourcing jobs, not for being rich. Always come back and acknowledge and appreciate the contributions of hardworking people and how we can benefit from those solutions. And the last key in centering working people is relating the economy to communities and families. Relating more broadly is going the last mile in our messaging, expressly stating that a policy is good for the economy and how everyone benefits. If the slide changes, it looks like it's working on it. <laughs> there we go. What's good for one is good for all. We know how hard we work to take care of ourselves, our families, and our farms. What's good for us is good for all. Take this tweet as an example. By reducing inputs and spending less, we can benefit our community and a policy concern. This example centers agency, community values, and benefits forward messaging that echoes what the actions of one can do for all. This framing is particularly useful for people who believe that their individual decisions do not have an impact. So some key takeaways. It's not about climate. It's about working people, their pocketbooks, and their families. Our messengers are crucial, and it's our job to find ways to resonate with people on the shared value of hard work and demonstrate climate solutions as good for rural economies. We need to meet people where they're at. That doesn't start by being partisan. It starts by meeting people within shared values. If we can do this more, climate becomes less of a culture war issue and instead becomes about economic prosperity and resilience. Now, demonstrating rural credibility. A quick thing, all of these narrative keys mean nothing if you don't choose the right messenger. Think of family farmers, well-known business owners, longtime community members. We can train these folks to become trusted media messengers on our issues. When we think about narrative, it's 75% messenger and 25% message. We've all seen it before. With the wrong messenger, it doesn't matter what you say. It's a losing proposition. 
Now, finally, in our order of operations, now that we've established those first three steps, only then can we begin to move people towards policy or practice. This is where your knowledge shines. The narrative framework that we are talking about here shows how we lead with working people and not policy. But at some point, we need to make a pivot. This is where your talking points about what you know of the solutions that'll benefit local economies comes in. It's not enough to pivot right in the beginning of your talking point. We have to first cue it up with the methods that we're talking about today. But once we have, you're ready to start moving people. So here's a quick uh, review of the five keys, but just remember, center and lead with working people. Use it almost as a checklist, right? Who is my messenger? Who am I centering in this narrative? And does it make the case that what's good for them and good for me is good for the broader economy? Really quick, we're just closing out. Um, remember, we are not leading with climate alarmism. We're not leading with villains. And we're going to lead with respect and focusing on the tools and opportunities for people to build a good life. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here and happy to take some questions. Uh, Madeline, that was uh, fantastic. One thing I love uh, 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 that I'll definitely take away is it's a, there's a process. I'm a process person. <laughs> you know, order of operations. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The order of operations is something I will definitely take away from me. And it's just, it, it's amazing to me that uh, the research that you've done, I might ask you to speak on it. Like, how do you, how did you get to this process? It, how much it mirrors what Dr. Catherine Hayho has told us in the past and Bob Perkowitz from Eco America that you always should start with values and then make the connection and then pivot to, to something that, uh, you know, after you've created that bond with them. So that's, that's I, I love the fact that we're just reinforcing that idea over and over. Um, so I'm going to, uh, Flannery uh, Winchester, our communications director, senior director of communications, has been moderating the Q&A. And Flannery, I'm wondering, uh, you know, which questions are generating the most interest from the, our volunteers out there, or is there like some themes that are surfacing there? Sure. So um, our top upvoted question so far is from Camille. They're asking, of the shared values that you mentioned, how did you discover that the hardworking value is uh, the most effective or resonant? Hmm, absolutely. So all of the keys within this narrative framework come from what's something called the winning jobs narrative, which is a poll tested message framework that was conducted over the course of, I believe, two years and hundreds of thousands of phone calls, surveys, door to door canvassing, uh, which is the idea of some of these shares values that are resonant across class, race and geography. So I think that anyone who's lived in a rural place can say, yeah, being hardworking is definitely an identity, but we also have the research research to back it up. Awesome. Um, and so we had another question um, that actually we answered it, so it's on a different tab. Okay, um, this is a question from Robert who uh, says, uh, they understand what you're saying about not leading with climate catastrophe, um, but the problem many of us face is uh, talking to folks who maybe don't believe in, in climate change. Uh, and so Robert's asking, he's saying place is great, but is it enough? Hmm. That's a great question. And I guess we're not asking to ignore climate alarmism, right? We're not trying to throw it out with the bathwater. But what we're saying is that conversation won't go very far unless you first lead with some of the shared values and shared experiences that could open up to a more difficult conversation. So, so often we don't make it to that point with folks that disagree with us, regardless of which side of the aisle or what geography you live in, because there are these culture war framings that don't invite us in. But what we're saying is if we center working people and we center our own agency, then perhaps we can begin to move to some of that more difficult policy action and more difficult conversations. Makes sense. Um, okay, we have a question from Alex here asking, can you provide an example of a conversation that you've had um, where maybe you, uh, some, of this, some of this comes to life a little bit? Can you give us a, a for instance? Absolutely. Um, I, for most of this past year, have worked on a ranch in my hometown. I live in Boulder, Utah, and I have a manager there who he and I disagree very vehemently on many issues related to climate and policy. I find that when him and myself are getting into a tough conversation, which can almost last two and a half days <laughs> sometimes, um, that it's helpful to remind each other, hey, we're neighbors. We both live in a small town. I love you and I want to keep working with you for the rest of my life. Now, 
that we have addressed this and we both know that we're hardworking people that have a connection to this place, let's start figuring out some of the more difficult things that we disagree on. Um, but I have found time and time again, it's almost like some of those things that live deeply in our guts, like speaking to a close friend, right? A compliment sandwich, some of these, these tools and tactics that we use as communicators when we're talking to rural people and when we're talking about climate solutions, try to find those human interest commonalities, those shared values. And I promise you that a, a little bit of authenticity goes a long way. Love that. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more, Ricky, yeah? Okay, um, so one thing about uh, Citizens Climate Lobby is our uh, preferred climate policy is a carbon price that, uh, or carbon fee, I should say, with um, the revenue returned to uh, to American households. And so we have a question here from Stuart asking, how would you pitch a carbon pricing policy that returns the money collected back to the people? Mm, yeah. <laughs> question to just throw at you that's a uh I yeah without getting into the nitty-gritty of this policy specifically I would say that I would lead without any finger pointing of who's creating carbon footprint right so there was an example in the presentation where there was an example of a tweet that said we could get a lot further in clean energy if we could talk about this work more as making people's lives better and less as reducing greenhouse gas emissions so I would say who are some of the folks that are going to benefit from these policies that you're implementing? How can you identify them, train them as trusted messengers, and center their stories as you start to build towards policy action? Um, but never lead with pointing fingers. <laughs> Helpful. Awesome. Thank you, Madeline. All right, Ricky, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, thanks again, Madeline. Uh, there's just so much to take away here and, and for us to digest. But uh, we are going to need to do that pivot as well, pivot to the rest of our agenda for today. You're more than welcome to hang out and listen, but I realize it's Saturday. You're in a beautiful part of the country and this heat dome is finally lifting. So we empower you as well to go enjoy uh, the beautiful outdoors for the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Nice to meet all of you or to you know, see all of you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting and I can't wait to listen in. Thanks so much. All right. It's great. So uh, before we... Uh, move on to hear from CCL volunteers, Lori and Rob Byron, about their personal and political breakthroughs. I, I just wanted to share a few highlights uh, from your work this past month and also to talk about some upcoming events that you should uh, be excited about. So let's talk about uh, this past month. We set a goal uh, to send 7,000 messages to Congress about the Technical Service Providers Act, right? Not the most sexiest thing in the world. It's not as great as carbon pricing in, in a lot of people's eyes, but wow, like we severely misjudged your passion because together uh, you guys sent over 12,289 messages uh, to Congress about the uh, Technical Service Providers Act. So you just slayed that, that goal. Um, and then, you know, looking at like the total number of actions right now on screen, this is what we did last year in August of 2022, took about 10,483 collective actions together. And this year, as you can see in August, uh, really blew that away up to 13,603 actions. And this is kind of a dead or not dead, but slow part of the year too. Lots of vacations are wrapping up. Kids are going back to school. So to see that type of increase really shows the momentum you're building for all types of uh, climate policies uh, across, the, uh, in, across the country. It, what's included in those numbers are 56 town hall events. And you saw some pictures if you were on early of people meeting uh, in town hall events with Republicans and Democrats ac across the country. It's super exciting to see. Uh, you really took advantage of the, the situation, which is members of Congress were back home in the district and they were there. And so that only happened because of your determination to keep climate at the top of the mind for members of Congress during this August recess. So thank you so much for that. All right, so we're gonna try something here. Uh, that we haven't tried ever before, because our, our action for this month, one of our main actions for this month, the Climate Action Program action, is to call our members of Congress. Well, we've called members of Congress before, but we have a new way of doing it now, where we're actually going to call you. And so Brett Cease uh, is uh, uh, on the screen right now, and he's going to take a, a couple minutes here just to demo the Call Congress tool. So Brett, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take over. That sounds great. And raise your hand since we can see you today. And we brought back the meeting format. If you've already taken action, 
I know that we're already at 800 calls. So thank you for those of you that have already done this at home. In the actual chat, I put a link where you can take action today, whether it's right now with me or on your own time after today's meeting. It's just cclusa.org forward slash take dash action. And here is the simple demonstration and an actual call of what this is going to look like. You go to that website, you enter your contact information as usual, and then before you actually make the call, you can preview the script that you can see right here for the suggested call with Senator Padilla. And when you're ready and you've reviewed any of the FAQs on that action page or the script and made it your own, you can click call me. So that's what I'm actually going to do. I'm going to have that call go through here on my phone and I'm going to put it on speakerphone so that you can actually hear along with me. Can you pull on to be connected to your member of Congress? So I answer my phone. And when I'm ready, I play, I press the button one. Voicemail or a call recipient to end the voicemail and proceed to the next call press star. All right, so I'm going to press one to start because I'm feeling ready. The office of Senator Klobuchar. Press one when you are ready to be finished. All right, so I pressed one. It's connecting me. It might go through a little bit of a ring. The office of Senator Klobuchar could not be completed. Call it with the office of Senator Smith. And it skips over to the next press one, one then. You are and I'll press one. And here we go. It goes right to voicemail. Call in the office of U.S. Senator Tina Smith of Minnesota. If you've reached this message during normal business hours, then all of our lines are currently busy. Please feel free to leave us a message. Thank you again for calling. Here's where I can personalize my message. When you are and when I'm done, I press start to advance to the next call. Hello, Senator Smith. This is Brent Cease giving you a call from Duluth, Minnesota. My zip code is 55812. Thank you so much for being a leader on climate change. I'm a constituent and a voter, and I'm calling today to specifically ask you to join forces with your colleagues on a comprehensive bipartisan permitting reform package that's going to include transmission, community engagement, and speed up the pace with which the U.S. builds and deploys new clean energy projects. If enacted, this is how important it is. Permitting reform legislation could reduce carbon pollution 12% by 2030 in this next decade. Thanks for taking action and have a great day. Then I press star. Your call with the office of Senator Smith has been. Perfect. I'll pass it back to you, Ricky, but that's the basic setup. And thank you all for taking action. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for demonstrating that, Brett. I think it helps people to sort of walk through that and see and feel what it um uh, feels what it feels like. And, you know, notice at the top, uh, he reached out to Senator Klobuchar's office and basically they said, it's not working right now. So <laughs> that's going to happen, right? They're going to reach out to certain offices. They're maybe going to say their voicemail is full or whatever. Just press star nine or star to go to the next call. Uh, those things will happen. Just like if you were, if you dialing out yourself, sometimes the, you know, the phones just don't work. All right. So thanks so much, Brett. And uh, thank you all for making those calls. It's uh, extremely important. And we hope you like the, the tool that calls you instead of you actually having to do the calls. Uh, but yeah, we're testing that out and see how that goes. Also this month, um, we're suggesting you work on recruiting a key community leader to lobby with your team in November. This is a highly leveraged and effective action. Um, and that comes directly from our um, our legislative team in DC. And I might even suggest that if possible to really recruit someone who is in your member of Congress's social network, that might even be more effective uh, than just a key community leader that they know about, but aren't, uh, you know, don't have a relationship with. It really is the folks that they have relationships with. It's definitely harder, but we're here to do the hard work. So if you can find that person, that would be fantastic. Finally, uh, as you gather at your chapter meetings, uh, we're asking you to practice the communication skills exercise. Uh, I know how valuable this has been to me personally because I'm not reading policy every day and practicing these things. So taking, putting the time aside, that's my system. We talked about I love systems, but to you know, give that constant attention, is, it's not only gonna help you with expressing your voice, but also help you experience your own personal breakthroughs. So what's coming up uh, that's really exciting? Uh, what's coming up next uh, in September, actually next weekend, is our CCL Inclusion Conference. We're going to be dropping the link into the chat here in just a moment for to register. It is a virtual event. Um, I had the honor last year, uh, and I think it's at cclusa.org slash 
inclusion, although it's being blocked on my screen for some reason. I can't see there, but they're dropping it in the chat right now. I had the honor last year of running the tech side of this uh, inclusion conference, and I can tell you that uh, CCL's diversity and inclusion director, Karina Ramirez, is so intentional about the program and the whole team there. I mean, there are way too many to mention here, but they put on a, put on a heck of an event. So please, uh, if you have the time next weekend, drop in. You don't have to attend the whole thing, but you know, check it out. It'll be great for you. And then also, we're asking people to begin and send the action sheet for this month to save the date for our fall conference. Registration is not open yet, but the fall conference is virtual this year and will take place on November 4th and 5th. And it sounds like we have some pretty big speakers uh, this year, uh, keynote speakers. Um, so please, uh, more information will be coming out on that soon, but I think it'll be something that uh, lots of people will be excited about. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on. Um, it's my honor, uh, really it is, to welcome Drs. Lori and Rob Byron. Um, I've had the privilege of hiking and camping with them uh, in Glacier National Park as we raise money for CCL. I think that was in 2014 or 2015. I can't remember which one. Uh, they're not only doctors, they're just super people uh, to, to get to know. So uh, let me say that they're not allowed to discuss the uh, specifics of the case, but they are able to answer some questions for us uh, because the, the case is still, you know, as you can imagine, pending and all this, or not pending, but will probably be appealed and all that. So uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, super excited to have you with us. Uh, I think the first question I would ask is, you know, as health professionals, what really drove you to use your experts, your expertise to get involved with this case? Go ahead. Okay. Oh, thanks, Will. Uh, Ricky, we've uh, been working the last eight or 10 years, uh, both nationally, but also a lot across Montana, uh, both through, CC through CCL and with many other organizations to increase awareness. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it was actually a, our children's trust reached out to us uh, to to know if we wanted to be involved and to be asked to do something that you've been working on for so long and to be able to be an advocate for something we believe in so strongly and unites both our climate action and our uh, professional as uh, health providers was just uh, an opportunity we couldn't pass up. And so I can imagine that there's this, um, you know, your personal beliefs, <laughs> you know, as you say, your advocacy, and there's also your, your professional experience. Um, how do you guys balance that when you're, when you're approaching things like this, uh, you know, these, these types of requests that you get? Well, I think there, there's always a little bit of, of tension. Um, one thing I can say as a healthcare professional, whether physicians and nurses, we deal with this a lot. When we see a patient, we try to give them the absolute best care we can, regardless of anything else, beliefs, culture, anything like that. In this case, though, it aligned very closely with our very strong beliefs that uh, air pollution and climate change is a impacting our health in a very dramatic way, and it's going to get worse if we don't do something. Um, we often often say that we got into uh, climate action because what we were doing in the exam room wasn't going to make a difference if we don't address climate change. Great. Um, got two more questions for you. One, one that I uh, will add to this, but um, the, the last question I've got is uh, now that you've had this experience, you know, how do you envision the role of health experts or you know, any expertise that people might have uh, out there listening today? Um, and, you know, using that in future advocacy for maybe not cases, but, you know, concerning the environment. So the skills that we all have and using the expertise, uh, how do you envision the role of people that want to use that? Uh, thanks, Ricky. Uh, well, first of all, in this case, they used climate scientist, a glaciologist and uh, economist and a couple doctors. And um other cases, I think we'll use different experts. For example, I have no doubt that someone is going to sue because of the loss of educational opportunity these last few weeks because of the heat dome. Uh, so then that'll pull in educators as, as experts also. The Sabin Center at Columbia University keeps track of these cases, and there's actually about 2,000 climate cases that have been filed around the world. Um, so we have suits against oil companies, against national and state and local government. 
um, some, of them, some of them are for financial losses, but some are for the incompatibility with the right to life and health that a lot of our constitutions have. And we have suits being brought by kids, by indigenous people, by NGOs, and even by a group of elderly women in Switzerland. And I think the courts need to watch out for these climate seniors. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to be um, expert witnesses, but even more opportunity to be plaintiffs. It's a little bit scary, but it's mostly fun. So follow what the other NGOs are doing in your area, because there are cases being filed in almost every state. And I think it's also important to remember that we don't want litigation to undermine our mitigation efforts. Uh, so these legal processes take years and they're just one more tool in the toolbox, but we still need carbon taxes and permitting reform and carbon farming and everything else. But for now, here in Montana, we are just basking in a rare and glorious climate victory. <laughs> and, you know, you, you've personally you got to feel good that you were a part of that. And I appreciate that. There are some questions that people are asking about the status of the case. Again, they're not able to comment on any of that uh, type of information, but there's plenty. We're dropping some links in the chat for folks that they can do their own research to see what's happening. We don't want to jeopardize anything that uh, with their testimony in the case. My last question for you guys, and this is sort of off the cuff, is just, you know, uh, what you've learned with CCL and how you've developed with CCL. And, you know, when we talk about empowering people, what role has that played uh, with it, with in, in your lives and, you know, especially with this case? No, well, I think uh, one thing, Ricky, and thanks for asking that, because uh, when we started with the CCL, that's kind of where a lot of this started, of trying to learn how better to uh, talk to people um, and uh, uh, communicate with people. Um, and uh, I think that just uh, builds on uh, the the earlier discussion about talking with rural folks um, of how to build those bridges, because if we can't talk to each other, then it's not going to work. We need to have a conversation. Yeah, I think um, like with the um, defense attorneys for the state, uh, you know, just in our testimony, being uh, being respectful, uh, listening to what they say, and and having kind responses, even though it was kind of um, totally totally contrary to what they were uh, wanting to believe or or trying to espouse. Yep, they're they're lawyers. They have their job to do, right? For sure. Thank you so much. I uh, I think you know I can say on behalf of probably everybody on this call that uh, we're all super excited that you what you did and your role in that and uh, hope to hear more about the case as it continues through. And uh, thank you so much for your efforts. We really appreciate it. Thanks for being here today. Go enjoy the beautiful Montana weather today too. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> thank you. For sure. I know I know what it's like there. So that's awesome. OK, um, the last thing we're going to do here is, uh, you know, we've in the past we have uh, you know, uh, done a, a roving camera that will go around the country and to see where uh, our groups and chapters are. There, there's Rob and Lori Byron right there. See, they're on camera. But we're going to do that again. Um, one thing well, before we do that, we are asking that you uh, log your attendance uh, today in the action tracker. So I'll drop some uh, links. I'll drop some information in the chat about how to do that here in just a moment. But uh, Brett, I'll turn it over to you to uh, get the roving camera started.
right. Back to you, Ricky. Thank you all so much for being here and having the Roman camera coming back. That is a great feature. It's so great to see everyone meeting in person. Um, to me, that's a, it's a key component of CCL, developing those relationships locally uh, together. It's, and it's just great to see that happening uh, all across the country as we come through COVID. Of course, we want you to do it when it's uh, okay in your area, but it's great to see that happening again. So thanks so much, everyone. Uh, have a great month, and we'll see you in, in October. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.